Heather Hefner, take one, Mark. So looking back at a decade of Kubernetes, how did it change the world? It revolutionized it. We didn't think people were necessarily going to put the technology stack in their mission critical transactions, and they did. I'm still shocked when, when we find out that Kubernetes is in space and Red Hat had something to do with that. Kubernetes is behind the airline flight that I booked this week or the credit card transaction I had. I don't think anyone could have ever dreamed that it would be as big as it is today. I really do think because it was approached from an open source and an open source way lens. It was allowed to grow and run wild in the ecosystem and become something of its own. I remember where I was when I first saw Kubernetes introduced. It was DockerCon 2014 in San Francisco. And Eric Brewer from Google announced that Google was open sourcing a thing called Kubernetes, which barely had a name at the time. Now, the reason to do an open source release right now in this space is because it's about the ideas. And I remember listening to this going, this is a really big deal. Uh, this is kind of amazing. And then I also remember helping to organize the very first KubeCon, which was several hundred people in a hotel ballroom in San Francisco. So we're going to get started with our keynote speaker, uh, Brendan Burns. He is one of the co-founders of Kubernetes. He is like God to you all. This is the thing that makes me the most proud about this whole project, is the number of people who have come together to submit code, to work on code, to send us issues, everything else that makes a community, that builds an ecosystem, that creates something that is more than just any one person or any one company, um, but uh, a really amazing community that's developing around a lot of really cool ideas. And now it's in the thousands of people. It is just mind-blowing. So when we were shipping 1.0, I was busy planning 1.1. We were planning uh, get-togethers to figure out what direction we wanted to go next, and I guess we back then was primarily uh, Red Hat and Google. Simultaneous to that, we were trying to figure out what we are going to do for OpenShift. Uh, and that pushed us in a lot of areas that have still been formative to Cube. Things like multi-tenancy which were very important in the earlier days of OpenShift, still important today for these applications. We spent a lot of effort in the uh, 15 to kind of 17 time frame, ensuring that the use cases that Red Hat customers care about were first class citizens in Kubernetes. And it's so funny because it came full circle for me personally, where in those years I was working in the Kubernetes ecosystem to ensure that it had GPU support, uh, high performance networking support like InfiniBand. And ultimately those are the technologies required to train machine learning models. So we did some work, net, uh, you know, this is now six years ago, or seven years ago, and now we're back selling product that leverages the technologies built several years back in the Kubernetes community. You know, as one of the 30 members that before the CNCF existed and before Kubernetes blew up, you know, met in the basement of Galvanize in San Francisco to talk about the possibilities of what Kubernetes could do for the ecosystem. And from that really kind of emerged where, you know, we as Red Hat wanted to take it. Obviously seeing the importance for our customers and communities in terms of hybrid cloud. So one of the things that came out of Kubernetes in terms of changing the world there was, how do we look at data? How do we look at storage? And where the cloud vendors saw Kubernetes as an opportunity to have a gravity well to keep data uh, where it was created, we saw also a challenge with that with our customers in terms of privacy, keeping things on-prem, keeping things in cloud, and, and respecting, you know, running the application where it makes the most sense. As we look to the future of AI and how we're doing that, you know, it's still going to become one of the most important things that we need to be looking at beyond just the disk storage or the storage in the cloud. Beyond the technology there, we're actually talking about things that touch everyone's daily lives. When we're talking about storage, we're talking about data, we're talking about the secret sauce of customers. And from all of that, 
is how we build these LLM models um, in AI. So I think transformatively, Kubernetes has changed the industry, it's changed the way we run, the way we manage. Containerization is huge. Looking into how Kubernetes will change to accommodate how we run AI apps is, is going to really be data focused. Democratizing distributed computing. Turn back the clock to 2001, right? I worked on some early distributed databases. And people who started recently don't necessarily know how it was where if you wanted to have a distributed computing project, right, something that would distribute out your work to a bunch of machines, et cetera, you hired a whole team of experts to actually run that for you. And they would spend six months just setting it up. And that made that kind of computing really not accessible to most people, even to most companies. And what's happened over the life of Kubernetes is we've really made using distributed computing in order to do whatever your thing is accessible to everyone who can afford a little cloud time. The world in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and then it goes live in 2016. In those, those years, we were pushing to cloud infrastructures or infrastructures that we didn't necessarily own as uh, promoters of technologies. And those infrastructures at that time were not necessarily the best in the world. They weren't the most stable, but they were the cheapest and they allowed you to do more creative things. And so you needed a distributed system that would be declarative in nature where you would teach it how you wanted something to look. And no matter what happened on that infrastructure, it would be smart enough to just go and replicate that and make sure that that was always the case. Every, every second, is it still there? Is it still there? Is it still there? Is it isn't? I'll put it back and don't worry about the, the crappy infrastructure that I'm running on. I'll, I'll take care of that up in the technologies. You take that and then you do more things on top of it. You, you train that loop to look at is the database backed up? Is a transaction executing? And then you start building more and more complex tasks on top of that loop. And we were able to do that with OpenShift and bring a developer experience on top and bring an application platform on top, all being driven by this declarative nature engine underneath the hood. And people were able to do fantastic things with that. They were able to increase their throughput on bank transactions. They were able to put open shift in space on the International Space Station. I mean, we're, we're blown away by how much customers have incorporated the technology and how they do business with their end customers. Prior to Kubernetes, you had to be a jack of all trades. That turned into special interest groups. So if you're interested in storage, if you're interested in how workloads are deployed, if you're interested in how etcd works, you can spend all your time with a community of like-minded individuals and do what you like to build an entire ecosystem called Kubernetes. One thing that makes me super happy about the trajectory of Kubernetes is the community that's developed around it, the Kubernetes and now broader cloud native community. It's this amazing welcoming community and it's just been an awesome experience for, for me and in my career. Over the past 10 years, I've met an amazing bunch of folks with various backgrounds, with various interests. I would not trade that bunch of folks for anyone else. I would love to see the community grow further. It needs more people involved. It needs more individuals that are able to understand these more complex systems. There's a lot of very excited new people without the experience. The problem is there's not as many experienced people as I would like to see who can help design. So sometimes people are like, I want this shiny new feature, and they're only looking at that feature. But right now, there's a lot of tech debt within the Kubelet um, that needs to be addressed before we go too much further. What I'd really like to see is more people that are experienced that are involved, who has experience in distributed systems, in AI, in HPC, get involved within the community to help the designs for the future. Well, 
Well, I'm going to start off with a quote from a ex post or tweet from Timothy St. Clair, who uh, is an OG Kubernetes contributor. Half the internet depends on you, no pressure. Now we're seeing it in Kubernetes being used as a platform to drive AI. So with that, uh, organizations can run uh, their AI ML workloads on Kubernetes. So six years ago at this KubeCon, KubeCon Europe in Germany, I believe, OpenAI, they were a keynote speaker and they talked about how Kubernetes powers the future of AI. Six years later, we all know that as ChatGBT. One of the things that we have a lot of involvement here is people wanting to do what we call taking Kubernetes to the edge, right? Which is, they want to say, hey, yes, you can run your web applications, your mobile applications, et cetera, on Kubernetes, but we also have all these devices, and these devices have computers in them, and we need those devices to run specific software, and we need to treat them as a computing cloud, right? And Kubernetes out of the box won't let us do that, but it's an open source platform, and it is highly pluggable, and therefore, we can write our own thing that will do that with this new version of Kubernetes. Um, and the, that really resonates with me because, like I mentioned, you know, starting out with Kubernetes version 0.4, that was my use case, right? And it involved hacking the early Kubernetes to make it work in that environment. And I think one of the things that we're going to see going forward is we're going to see increasing use of that, right? Because we're not going to get less computers and devices. Right? We're going to get more computers, those computers are going to be more powerful, managing and controlling and securing, right? All those devices are going to become more and more important, which means that you need to be able to control them, you need to be able to um, control what software is working on them um, as, as a computing cloud, just like you would a bunch of web servers. One of the craziest experiences I've had that was so awesome personally is I went to a party on, on a friend's dock and while I am there, there's a guy from Duke who works in an IT department. And you know, I always talk to an IT guy uh, and, and I'm talking to him and he starts talking about Kubernetes and this new thing and I'm like, I'm building that. What would you like it to do? And this guy was like, Hey honey, hey honey. And he called his wife. And then I, at that moment I realized, oh wow, girls, look, I'm semi-famous. Uh, and so for that one instant uh, on that dock, a not famous person got to show off my kids and they still remember it. It was awesome. Happy birthday, Kubernetes. Happy birthday, Kubernetes. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kubernetes. It's been great seeing you grow up. We're excited to see what happens when you grow up into a teenager and a, and a young adult. Happy birthday, Kubernetes, and thank you to all the community members and all the like minds that work together to make Kubernetes what it is today.